opportunities. Record the uh, no problem. No problem. Uh, when it gets to it, I will, I will allow you to do the hosting. Okay. Yes, so, sir. We are recording. I thought maybe we need host to record, but we are recording already. Yes, I'm already recording. Okay, uh, sir. Thank you. I've gone through this one. We've gone through this. We've gone through this. This was where we stopped that day. Okay. So, um, Kopi, this is your question. Are you hearing me, sir? Yes, I can hear you, sir. John. Yes, sir. John. Yes, sir. John. Okay, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Sir, so Dr. Okopi is answering you, sir. Okay, John, you John, you can hear me now. John. I don't know whether it was my network. I was answering and I wasn't. I had to go We're out. We're hearing you at the time. Well, I think you now got logged out. Then now our chief is logged out. No, I, I logged out. I thought maybe nobody was hearing me. Okay. okay. We're hearing you. Okay. All right. So, Jacqueline, it was what? Yes. Eh? I think it was. It, it put, he, he was showing us an echo. Yes. Picture, okay. yes. Uh, a picture of him. Hello, John. Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. It's okay. Okay. So this is your question. Yes, sir. A 48 year old lady presented with a bilateral leg swelling. <clears throat> Shop neck, bilateral leg swelling. Hello, Prof. Hello, Prof.
Yeah. Can you hear me now? Hello, John. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, so Jacqueline, uh, see John is not hearing me take over. So it's uh, this is a fee, um, a forty eight year old lady uh, who presented with uh, bilateral leg swelling, abdominal swelling, and um, um, a difficulty in breathing, and. The echo was done, and this is what you see on the echo. Can you look at this image and interpret what you see? What other tests would you like to would you like to uh, order for? And what, how will you? Uh, what would be your uh, diagnosis? and final diagnosis and how will you manage a def manage a definitive diagnosis go ahead okay sir please um how old is the patient i missed that sir 48 okay sir um the echo findings what i can see in the echo it's um an apical four chamber view Uh, well, Hello, Doctor. Like, is back. Mm -mm. Go ahead. Another person will go for Copy. Okay, another sir. person will come for you. I was, I was trying to call you on the uh, land call since you were not hearing you. Okay, I'll answer the next one. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. This is um, a. It looks like a transgastric view of a transesophageal echocardiogram showing okay um, how will you how will you differentiate between trans thoracic and and um uh, osophagia uh, um trans osophagia echo so i think it has to do with the positioning of the the atrium and the ventricle. I think in the transesophageal echo, the atrium tends to be superior. Mm. So I'm not very sure. Yeah? No, that is not true. You talk to this one first. Okay, so what I can see here is um, the atrium and the ventricle both appear dilated. And there appears to be an incompetent tricuspid valve. Go ahead. There appears, there appears to be a tri, an incompetent tricuspid valve. So my differentials here would be in this patient that has bilateral leg swelling, she's breathless. This patient that has bilateral leg swelling, she's breathless. I would consider the possibility of a pulmonary, well, possibly primary pulmonary hypertension. I'll, One, also, consider, I'll also consider the possibility that she has a a, a valvular abnormality, probably rheumatic uh, tricuspid valvular abnormality, then I'll, cons I'll consider the possibility, because of how dilated the atrium and the ventricle are, I also consider, even though I cannot really make out where the valve is here, but I'll, I'll, I'll consider the possibility also as well that this patient has um, a congenital heart abnormality, possibly Epstein's abnormality, well, and then uh, I'll consider a, a, a pulmonary embolism or, yes, a, either a, a pulmonary embolism in this patient and then a right-sided heart failure from other causes, uh, maybe cardiomyopathy, like arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Mm. 
or okay. an endomyocardial um, fibrosis as well. Yeah, that's fine. So, which other investigation will you order for? Uh, um, in this patient, I would like to. What is the most possibility here? Forty-eight year old. She has two children. So I'll think about the primary pulmonary hypertension. Hello, sir. With the, with respect to the spontaneous echoes, she, she, I don't know if that's very significant in this patient because I could see that in this um, echocardiography, we can see spontaneous echoes and some form of pericardial effusion and, of course, tricuspid incompetence, some... Um, 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 the pressure on the right side is quite high and the little right, left, right uh, ventricular right atrium. So I, I just wanted to ask if that spontaneous echo is something I'm seeing or it's just me that I'm seeing it. It's not obvious. No, it's a still image. There's spontaneous echo. There's no doubt okay. about that. So what, which investigation would you order? So okay, I would like to. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I would like to do it, um, ECG, an echo has already been done. I also like to do a chest x-ray to mm -hmm. um, assess the vessels. That then I would like to... What would the chest x-ray give to you? It will help me look at the other vessel, that the other organs around the heart. For instance, the, the pulmonary artery, the aorta as well. Lizzie, I'm in a meeting, no? I'm in a Zoom meeting. I'm in a Zoom meeting. Go ahead. Okay. So I'll also like to do a, I'll like to cut, I'll like to do a characterization, right heart characterization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for you said you want to do, you want to do this chest x ray. I want to do an and ECG. I want to do it. What would they give to you? Okay, the ECG would help um, suggest, it could help suggest the etiology, for instance, it could um, show the, of which I have seen that in an echo. However, it might point towards a it right, show what? It might show that there's right-sided um, enlargement, right atrial, right ventricular enlargement, which is already being seen on the echo. If it's because of a pulmonary embolism, it will also give me an idea if there's sinus tachycardia, in some specific cases, there might be the specific sign of the S1QT3 pattern in these patients. I might also see evidence of right bone to brand block, T wave inversion in the V1 to V4. If it's a pulmonary embolism, it will help me to um, um, hone down on that diagnosis. Then I would want to also um, do a chest x ray. Chest x ray would show me the pulmonary anatomy. The pulmonary artery anatomy, if there's um, dilation of the pulmonary vessels, it might also show me that. For a patient who also has a um, um, possibility of a wedge infarct, I could also pick that from a chest x-ray. And then if there's any affectation of the other um, um, organs surrounding the heart, too, I could pick that out in a chest x-ray. Then... I want to go on to actually know what um, the pressures are like in the pulmonary artery. I want to do a right heart catheterization to look at the pulmonary um, artery pressure, which I would have gotten an idea of from the echocardiogram, or to uh, to confirm it and also know whether there is an involvement of the. What is the normal artery? pulmonary artery pressure? Normal pulmonary artery pressure should be less than um, twelve. No, yeah, should be less than 20 millimeters of mercury between um between eight to say 18 millimeters of mercury. Mm. Is that how we measure pulmonary artery pressure? Pulmonary artery pressure. pressure is systolic over diastolic. Okay, sir. The pulmonary artery pressure should be um, about 25 millimeters of mercury systolic and diastolic will be 12 millimeters of mercury averagely. 
but with the recent guidelines, above 20 millimeters of mercury is considered elevated um, pulmonary artery pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, uh, so your final diagnosis is uh, embolism of pulmonary, uh, oh. primary pulmonary artery hypertension or which one? So the with what I have here, I can't really, really stick out my neck for one of them, but I I would go with um a primary pulmonary hypertension because this patient has had the leg swelling, bilateral leg swelling, and then dyspnea. Mm -hmm. So something has probably built over time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, that's fine. But there are things I expected you to uh, to mention here. And though it's not a moving image, so it, it's not really that very clear. But if you notice on this, um, the, the still image on the left, you okay. notice that the left atrium is, is so dilated why yeah. sorry the right atrium is so dilated yeah. why the left is pushed towards one side then the same thing also occur in the okay uh, evening uh, that Hello, Jacqueline. I'm not hearing you. I used okay, to I think um, Chief got locked up. So I am on a call. I'm on a call. Please just okay. wait for me. I'm okay. on a call. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry, sir. Mm.
<laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have we have the le the left be squeezed out to a narrow zone, while the right is so much dilated. Then, are you seeing my cursor at all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Where the cursor uh, pointer is, that is where the uh, that is where the um, the the tricuspid originate from. This is where the tricuspid okay, originate from. I can from. see it. I can see it, sir. Yes. Yeah, so why here is where the um the where the uh, uh, the mitral originated from. So when we measure, we got almost uh, twelve to fourteen uh, millimeter difference. So okay. we are suspecting that you have. A, the lady had Epstein's anomaly with atrialization. Okay. Your differentials are in line. They are fine. They, they are all in line. If, if in an exam, you will still pass the station, even though you didn't point to the particular diagnosis, you will still pass it. Uh, then, so this is more like Epstein's anomaly. That is what is easier. So the test you will do here to... Um, to unravel it is you need a CT or an MRI, um, um, uh, a cardiac MRI or a CT MRI to really quantify the differences in the VAR because echo, you may have a lot of shortcomings in echo. Then the def, uh, uh, doing your uh, right heart characterization, you also write. Then uh, treatment as um, uh, is more of symptomatic for medical, uh, including uh, you use diuretics. Um, then you also put her on very small doses of because most of them, their BP is usually very poor, so you put her on a very small dose of other things like. Um, a uh, spiral or a uh, prerelon, maybe 12.5, then anticoagulate her properly, then walk her up for, uh, for surgery. So definitive treatment is surgical repair of this valve. That is the definitive treatment. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, yeah. Do you have any question here before we move yes, to the Yes, sir, please. One? The 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 image was so enlarged that I I missed the view. It looks now that I look at it, it appears like it's an apical four chamber view. But the the yes. left side is just so compressed. It's so co compressed to one corner. Yeah, okay. you are right. Okay. No problem. Uh, I didn't have time to write all the notes on it because I be the work is so much on my head. But I had every idea of what I want to pass out to you guys on these images. Right. Okay. Uh, copy. John. Yes, sir. Okay, this is your case. Okay, sir. This is a 97-year-old man who presented with shortness of breath and difficulty in breathing. Hi. This is the echo you did. Yes, sir. Is there any is there anything you want to tell us on this echo? Can you hear you, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now, sir, but initially I wasn't. Okay. 97 year old. Okay, sir. Who presented with shortness of breath? Okay, and, sir. Uh, this is the echo. Is there any anything you want to tell us on the echo? Anything you want to tell us, sir? No, I'm trying to enlarge it to see. Okay. If I can longer exist view and then. This looks like um, aortic stenosis. 
good aortic stenosis. Good. So, what are other uh, other signs and symptoms of this patient? List five five ish. Hello, sir. Well, aortic stenosis secondary to what? Maybe a bicuspic aortic. No, it looks like degenerative um, bicuspic aortic valve. Degenerative bicuspic aortic valve uh -huh, could also be what? The, yes. Um, from a rheumatic fever, which I don't expect for now. Pijet disease is a possibility. Um, okay, rheumatic could also be what? It rheumatic, could from, yes. It could also be from Pijet disease of the bone. And enter renal failure, that's for the acquired causes for the congenital causes, the bicos with aortic valve. Um, which is the common yes. Yeah, it's for yes. age above 65 years of age. What else could it be? Okay, the possible causes are huh? I don't know. Yes, yes. Okay, if the patient has end stage renal failure, it can also contribute as part of the other. Um, secondary causes. Okay, so what other investigation will you do for this patient? Okay, for this patient, I would love to do basic investigations like the ECG where I'll find left ventricular atrophy restraint in some cases, tetra enlargement, some left bundle branch block. I also want to do the chest x ray. The chest x-ray may show some calcific valve, especially the aortic root, and then a distended um, ascending aorta. I also want to do a, right, a, a cardiac catheterization and the possibility of doing a concomitant um, repair if there is some coronary artery disease. I also want to do a dopamine stress test to check to differentiate between a pseudo-aortic stenosis and a true aortic stenosis. And then I want to do a background investigation, you and E creatinine, to check the renal status, to check other secondary. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Now, what are the indications for surgery? So the indication for surgery will be dependent on um, the following: if the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. For patients that are asymptomatic, the EF should be less than 50%. It's an indication for surgery. Um, if uh, the patient is symptomatic, if symptomatic severe aortic stenosis with valve area less than one centimeter square is also an indication for surgery. Um, uh, basically, I think that's that's what I can remember for now. So I'm not going through the so criteria. When you say the patient has very severe aortic stenosis, you are talking yes, about mean gradient, mean gradient uh, more than sixty millimeter yeah. of mercury, or a V yeah, mass more, more than five. More than Am I right? Four. Yeah, it's more than four to five. More than yeah, five five cent uh, meter per second. Yes, sir. Then also talking about, you're also talking about severe valve calcification. Yes, sir. Um, um associated by the current uh, by the city and um, mm -hmm. um with a uh, mass more velocity of more than that is progression, yearly progression of what? When you are talking about yearly progression, what do you what do you use it for? Yearly progression of more than uh, uh, zero point three meter per uh, uh, per second per year. That is also indication for surgery. Am I right? Yes, I. What is, of ele elevated B elevated BMP level? Okay, I'm not aware of that, sir. But I I think it is, sir. It's also part of it. Elevated BMP more than three times age and says control uh, uh says corrected for age i uh, think okay. confirm it with the guideline please please okay. confirm it with the guideline yeah okay um 
I will still ask more questions on it, on aortic stenosis. Uh, okay, sir. Then your echo finding, please go through the echo findings, even though we will not talk about them. Okay, go sir. Go through the, yeah, the echo finding. I have an idea of what the echo findings may be. I think we'll okay. come back to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So I think these are some of the recommendations. I will come back to this later on. Okay. Who next are we taking? Uh, where is um where is Dr. Godia? Is Dr. Godia here? Yes, sir. Dr. He's Godia. Here, sir. Okay, I've not heard his voice. It's in the background, sir. I, I, I can't hear him. Dr. Godia, sir. Hello, sir. Good. I've, I've yeah, heard I... your voice. No, yes, no, no problem. I've heard your voice. Fantastic. Yes. Now, this is case number eight. Uh, it's um, a 56-year-old uh, year man. Um, before we go to this case, there's something I want to ask uh, 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 John. Yes, sir. John. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That patient is 95. If you are yes, to give the patient up for surgery, if the patient up for surgery, what, what type of valve will you use? Sir, I want to use a bioprosthetic valve, sir. Why? Give reasons. Yes, sir. Because of the age, the patient is elderly, and then the fact that the bioprosthetic valve will not require any form of anticoagulation with the age, good, good anti anticoagulation may predispose the patient to um, having um, um, the adverse Bleeding. effect. Bleeding. Yes. Yes, sir. And okay. then uh, basically, because of the age, I wouldn't want yeah, to. Yeah, 95. But if the patient is uh, 50, what type of valve will you use? Uh, I think less than 65. I can give a, a mechanical valve. Uh, but Maybe. the way to answer that question, the way to answer is that each patient will be individualized. Okay, sir. Do you prefer that the patient go for, uh, for a mechanical valve? Uh, but if the patient opt for otherwise, you will still go ahead with the surgery with what the patient offer. But you advise, you tell the patient about the advantage and disadvantages of each of the valves. Because in mechanical valve, the patient will be on anticoagulation for life. Yes, sir. <laughs> While in bioprosthetic valve, the patient will be on anticoagulation for about three to six months. And after that, you can put the patient on clobetogram. So the risk of... Uh, of uh, uh, or bleeding is less, but, but the issue with bioprosthetic, sorry, bioprosthetic valves for every 10 years, that patient may undergo another surgical repair of that valve because that valve may degenerate at the age at uh, with with uh, within 10 years uh, after 10 years of implant. Sorry, sir, I just wanted to ask if a ROS procedure will also be encouraged for an elderly person. Or it's for young people in this case of aortic stenosis. Uh, as I said, um, you can use it, but the question is that you have to individualize it. Okay, sir. Yeah. All right, sir. So, Godia. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Godia. Yes, sir. This is a 65 year old uh, man who presented with. Uh, um with uh, with uh, palpitation and difficulty in breathing so part of your evaluation is the echo 
and see what you saw on the echo. Yes, sir. Um, Wait, well, I'm coming. Um, Let the echo play. Can you describe what you see? I can see a severe uh, um, mitral regurgitation. Um, with um, tickling of the mitral valve leaflets and uh, calcification of the mitral valve leaflets and the, and the tip. There, there is some, um, uh, there are also tickling of the paravalvular apparatus. Um, the, sorry, I, I, I Uh, let me start again. It's a parastanal, sorry, it's an epical uh, four chamber view echo. Um, that showed um, severe mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Um, there is um, tickling of the 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 valve the leaflets uh, up to the tips and um, <clears throat> um, tickling of the paravalvular apparatus. Um, there seems to be some degree of uh, stenosis as the valve is not uh, the valve opening seems to be restricted. Uh, uh, reduce <clears throat> it's not uh, uh, opening up to the um, it's not opening up to the level of the uh, the wall of the myocardial and interventricular septum so the okay the opening... which other which which what the, evaluating? The, the, wait, I'm coming. What are this? What are the clinical presentation of this patient? This is a patient with a valvular heart disease. What yes, are the sir. clinical presentation of this particular patient? Okay, it seems like a, a, a rheumatic mitral valve um, disease. So the clinical presentation. The patient will come with um, um, dyspnea uh, on exam. He may come with dyspnea on exertion. Come, with, he may come with um, cough. Um, uh, um, PND autopnea and uh, clots or minus leg swelling. That's I cannot hear you, sir. Hello. Hello. Am I audible now? Hello. Hello. Yes, you're audible. Can hear you? Yes, go ahead. The clinical presentations and yes, when you are scotted, wait. I hope you are getting me clear. If you are scotted, this patient describe the moment on a scotation. The, uh, the the momo will be um hello can you hear me sir i'm talking yes. describe I this momo on auscultation the momo will be um should be an epical uh pansystolic momo that uh, uh may radiate to the axilla um It's, it will be an epic pulse systolic momosa that I did to the axilla. 
No, you what I heard you said, you said that apical pass systolic murmur radiating towards the axilla. Is that all? Yes. Um well that um may be accentuated by um is uh, that may be accentuated by inspiration. Inspiration. So exhalation. 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 E exhalation. Expiration. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Be sure of what you are saying. No. What other moments may be associated with this disease? Mm. Other moments. Yes. Well, I I'm not sure because Austin Fleet is supposed to be if it's if it was Arctic, so it's not Arctic. Okay, now let's take it this way. List six epon uh, ep, epon epon six ep, uh, <coughs> eponyms of moments. One. The, there is um. Uh... Um, Austin Flint, Momo. Describe Austin Fleet. Wait, wait. Describe, describe Austin Fleet, Momo. Anyone you name, you have to describe it. Austin you Fleet, are a consultant Momo. cardiology. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Austin, Austin Flint, Momo is is a form of a uh, uh, my um. A form of an mitral regurgitant murmur that is as a result. Uh, is so that what I, they told you? It's, it's a form of. It's a. Hello. I'm hearing you, Austin Fleet. Describe it. What is Austin Fleet murmur? It's a murmur that is hard um, due to um, a regurgitant jet from. The Arctic, uh, from Arctic, yes, so it's an like aortic regurgitation moment. Why does it occur? Why does it occur? It occurs because there is, um, um, the Arctic, the, 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 the regurgitant jets, uh, tend to, um, um, affect the or that tend to. Um, affect the cooperation of the the because the regurgitant jet will hit on the mitral uh, valve. Yes, inlet. yes, and, is that is is now you are talking. Yes, yeah, So the regurgitant murmur, you are right. The regurgitant murmur, sorry, the regurgitant uh, uh, blood, the regurgitated blood, as they pass through the aortic insufficient aorta, they. The, it heat on the mitra leaflets. That is what produced that moment. That is your syphilit moment. So number two is what? Second eponymous moment. Name it and describe it. Galavadin the phenomenon. What is galavadin phenomenon? It's a, it's a physical examination finding. Uh, the disease in patients with uh, arctic valve stenosis. Um, it gives a momo at the apex. Uh, sorry, the, 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 there will be a, a holosystolic momo on the cardiac apex that. Um, no, that the question is that momo. why do you. Why, what is the rationale behind? A uh, galavadin phenomenon. It's a, it, you find it in aortic stenosis, aortic valve stenosis. What is yes, the rationale sir. behind it? 
in ordinary sense, where does aortive, uh, aortic valve stenosis murmur suppose radiate to? There are the uh, the aortic valve um murmur they radiate to the to the um uh, to the They are dead to the to the to the neck. Uh, they are dead to the uh, the radiation is to the uh to the neck. Um. Yes, but this one it goes where to the apex. It, it goes it go to the apex. So that yes, it is it is to the apex inside of radiating toward the toward the neck. Um, because so how do you distinguish? Um, how do you distinguish galavadin phenomena from aortic, from uh, um, from uh, from mitral regurgitation? Because they behave like the same. What maneuver do you do to distinguish them? Okay. Your network is not good, though. The the time is the apical momo is due to a matter. Okay, let me remove the earpiece. Good. Hello? I, yes, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. Go ahead. OK. So, so, so to determine if the epical momo that is here is uh, Yes, to determine whether the momo is due to matter or or addition of active momo, uh, there is this uh, dynamic auscultation. That can be no, what you do? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, by a, Doing hand grip exercise. Yes, yeah, so it's hand grip. By doing nice transient, uh, Correct. Hand term grip. Of pollution, which will increase the after load. And Correct. That will increase the momo of mitral loss. Okay, so now next one, what is the next eponymous moment? What is the next eponymous moment? Um, Jacqueline. Yes, sir. I think we have lost him. Can you can you take over from there? Okay, sir. Next eponymous moment. Okay, sir. We have the um the Moset sign. The Moset. What is the Moset? The Moset Hello. sign. Hello, yes. sir. Okay, he has come back. Hello. He has come back. Hello, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead now. We have other exam candidates, sir. I don't know if they can be given the opportunity, sir. Just give me so, their name. We have many questions today. I have a time with which is 12 o'clock. You must answer all the questions. 
what is Oga eponymous momo? Sir, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, am, am I audible? You are audible. List other eponymous momo and briefly describe them because we have many other questions. Okay, there, there, there is Kariku Momo, which is. What is Kariku short... Momo? Wait, what is Kariku Momo? It's, 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 it's seen in uh, acute rheumatic uh, carditis. It's a mitral. Why does he occur? Wait, why does he occur? It occurs due to mitral uh, valve inflammation, sir. Correct. Next one, next Momo is what? Um, ah, can I remember? Okay, let me. There's, uh, I think there's, yes, there's Graham Steel. Graham, what is Graham Steel, Momo? What is Graham Steel? Graham Steel, it's a soft, it's a Momo that is, um, it's, a, it's an early diastolic Momo that is, uh, at the left standard edge, um, left stand, diastolic momo. Yes. What causes that momo? What is it associated uh, with? It's pulmonary valve, um, pul pulmonic hypertension. Yeah, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, it's as a result of yes. It's as a it's a it's as a result of pulmonary incompetence. Uh. You are right. As a result of uh, pul uh, pulmonary valve yes. incompetence. So if a patient has... Yes. Now, let's go back. There are many other eponymous momo. Just check them out. So I was asking you which other eponymous momo is associated with this momo. So what I was expecting is Graham Steam momo. Because a patient that has um, this type of regurgitation is going to have... What, is going to have venous hypertension, which we trigger into what? Into uh, left-sided heart failure. And at the end of the day, the patient will still develop what? Graham T momo. But Graham T momo can also be associated with what? Um, mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis will also give a pressure increase in the left atrium that will also trigger what? Reactive... Uh, venous hypertension, which will continue to continue the heart failure and the patient may still come down with what? Uh, with uh, Graham T. Momo. So this is the way it goes around. Now, the next question for you is that what is Wiki's score and how will you... Uh, uh, no, 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 not Wiki's score. How will you apply... Uh, what is the next question now? I wrote them in my book here. Uh, how will you apply? Sorry, what are the indications for surgery in this patient? Hello? Uh, yes, what are the indications for surgery? And as a cardiology, if you are called to evaluate this patient uh, pre-surgery, what will be your request? Well, uh, the, the, um, the re review of the patient pre-surgery, sir, I will request for ECG. Um, ECG, yes. The ECG... I will see, uh, I'll be able to detect uh, if there's arrhythmias, like uh, with this degree of um, atrial dilatation, um, atrial fibrillation. Um, also, the degree of the dilatation of the uh, ventricle, there may be ventricular ectopics or um, even um, uh, some round of ventricular tachycardias. So, um, uh, I'll request for right, uh, 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 right and left heart catheterization. Um, Why are you requesting the, for right and left heart catheterization? 
give reasons. So access for, for, for the, for the left heart catheterization is to, for the right heart rather catheterization is to uh, see if there are evidence of pulmonary hypertension because of the degree of uh, mitral regurgitation that may okay. lead to uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension. And uh, also, it will be able to assist me at the, the degree of pulmonary hypertension, whether it will allow for uh, open heart surgery. Then, um, the, for the right heart catheterization is to assess, sorry, for the left heart catheterization is to assess for the pressure uh, in the left atrium and the left um, ventricle. Um, uh, on the echo, what are the things you are going to look out for on the echo in the patient with mitral regurgitation going in for surgery? Uh, this is just a regurgitant volume. Regurgitant, yeah, you can say you can use your a regurgitant length, your p, uh, your picker. Yes. Uh, okay. The the price. The regurgitant. I'll look for the regurgitant volume, the regurgitant jet, um, and um. Uh, The, the the um this regurgitant uh that's the 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 venal contractor assess for the venal contractor to see if it's up to six um uh five to six or greater than six um uh um Greater than six millimeter, that will uh, indicate a severe uh, regurgitation. Um, what else can I? Um, hello, hello. Hello. I think chief is not on the this thing. Or... Yeah. The vena yeah. contractor, uh, regurgitant volume, uh, regurgitant fraction, effective regurgitant orifice. And then the, I think so. Effective think... regurgitant volume is it more than 60 mils. Uh, uh, the regurgitant fraction more than 50%. Yeah. Uh, what, what the, yeah, the the, the, the venal contractor more than um six more than uh, six to then the EF. These are the stuff you'll be looking for this thing. And then the left to try large. Yes, the EF will be what? Hello the ejection front. Hello, sir. The e will be what? The EF will be reduced, sir. Yes, EF will be what? Less than 40%. To be specific. Okay, let's... Where did you get that 40% from? It's less uh, than 60%. 60, Sixty. oh yeah. It's less than 60 Jaya, I'm not hearing you. Okay. It should be less than 60. 60%. 60 yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, less than 60. And because the, look at it. Eh? Yes. There are ways to evaluate this thing. And the left venture. Uh, Hello? The end systolic. I can volume. hear you. Go ahead. So I I I mentioned the um, effective um, regurgitant orifice uh, 
um uh the yes. better contractor which is um six uh, greater than six um uh, millimeters um yes and it gets severe uh, then um uh re regurgitan regurgitan fraction greater than 50 um um all right then the ejection fraction uh less than um 60 uh i think so these are the things i'll be looking out for on the echo well still read more about it no problem read more about it so that you'll be able to answer questions that are targeting this area eh? now okay. uh, uh, who is the next person ajaye uh, Doctor Ajayi, Doctor Adebi, Doctor. Which other person is going for exam? Doctor Ajayi. Doctor Ajayi. Doctor Adebi, I'm not hearing Ajayi, you. Sir. Ajayi, sir, I don't know. You called Ajayi. Yes. What of Doctor Adebi? Doctor Ajayi, Doctor Adebi, Doctor Joko. Who else? Dr. Jennifer. Jennifer. Yes, sir. Jennifer, Doctor. is it the Jennifer in Lagos? Yes, sir. The very fair one, sir. Ah, okay. Is she here? I'm not, uh, Dr. Jennifer. Uh, is She's she here. is not answering. She's here, sir. She will answer now. Dr. Jennifer. Yeah. There is Dr. Dr. Jennifer. Fatima. I think she's busy, ma, sir. Oh, sir, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Joko. Yes, sir, Dr. Joko Dr. has Jennifer. been having network uh, Let me call Dr. Joko. She's been having network issues. Ah. Yes, yeah, she's getting logged out. Often. Okay. Dr. Ajayi. So, Dr. Ajayi, anybody from UNTH? No, that is going for exam. Okay, Dr. Ajayi. Ajayi is from uh, FMC Enegua. Ajayi, are you with us? Ajayi is not hearing us again, no? Please, that question, AF is also an indication for surgery, please. I know. AF is an indication for surgery. Are you Dr. Jaye? John, Ajaye is not asking anybody again. <sighs> Dr. Jai Dr. Okay, uh, John, you will take this one. Dr. Jai is not answering us. Dr. Debbie is also here. No, he's not answering. No, Dr. Debbie or Basanto. Good evening, sir. Uh, Doctor, Doctor Dibi. Good evening. Ah, uh, good evening. Are you with us now? Yes, sir. Good. So let's let's flow. This is case nine. The man is a seventy-eight year old, and he presented to you with, uh, with. Uh, uh, chest pain, and you did, you did uh, an echo. This is your finding. You see the echo on the left. This is your finding. Then an ECG, this is your finding. Please. All right, thank what you, sir. What do you think is going on? 
Th thank you, sir. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Looking at the image on my left, uh, I can see the Elta, possibly the <clears throat> possibly the Ascendi Elta. I can see that there seems to be on that left image there seems to be a dissection. Then looking at the image on the right, this echo, Adibi, this echo. What view is that? I think it's super, super stunning. No. Yeah. Who knows that view? So is it an apical three chamber view? That is apical three chamber view. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So I think you go ahead. Yes, yes, sir. So I can see on the right, I can see the the true lumen. Which is which one is the true lumen? Where that, the cursor is. I don't know whether my whether you can see my pointer. I don't know. No, I can't see your pointer, but okay. can you see my own? Okay. Yes, I can see your own. So that that's the true lumen. So then you think this one is the true lumen. Okay, where is the first lumen? Sorry. Nah, nah, nah. I think that's the that's the false lumen, please. That's the false lumen. The true lumen will which be one? to the right. The true the true lumen is to the right. No, which one is which? That the that one is to the right. This is this is the right now. On, which on, one? No. On, my, on on the right of my screen, what you are pointing is the false lumen. Okay. So it's, it's collapsing. It's almost collapsing the true limit, which is towards the right of okay. that. So, and the image on the right that shows the color flow, the echo image on the right that shows the color flow. So, uh, there are two lumens there. On that same image, the one on the right is the true lumen, while the one on the left is the false lumen. There seems to be flow of blood from the true lumen towards the false lumen. So I think it's the aortic dissection. No, 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 no. Look at it. Uh, yeah, it's, this is aortic dissection as you describe. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Maybe this this echo you see here, this is a three chamber view. Okay. If you see my cursor, okay. Okay. this one is the left. A true. Okay. This okay. is okay. the left ventricle. left ventricle. This is the aorta. So the true yes, yes, lumen sir. is this small thing here. Yes, sir. Why the first lumen is this big one? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. So how will you classify aortic dissection? Well, aortic dissection can be classified using two different uh, classification systems. So we have the DeBecky classification and the Stanford classification. The Stanford classification is uh, classifying to A and B. The Stanford A is uh, aortic, any aortic dissection from, I mean, that converts the ascending aorta. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just limited to the ascending aorta, while the Stanford B is uh, distal to the uh, ascend, as ascending aorta. So from the descending the aorta downward, that's B. Then the DeBecky classification, we have uh, one, uh, one to three, uh, three, three B. So we have class, I mean, the, the class one, that's from the uh, ascending aorta down, I mean, it, it's limited to the ascending aorta, while the class two is from an ascending aorta and does not go past the subclavian vein. Then the class three is, uh, from the descending aorta downward. Now three is divided to three A and three B. So for three A is from descending aorta down to the level of the uh, diaphragm, while three B is from diaphragm downward. Okay. Um. What What are the symptoms and signs 
that this patient would present with? Okay, sir. So uh, depending on the class of the uh, uh, LT dissection, the symptoms may include if it's involving the prosthema aspect of the aorta. So typically, the patient will present with chest pain, usually with rostana radiating to the back. And then the patient may actually notice this while doing activity. Okay. Getting, um, feeling dizzy, palpitation, uh, syncope or near syncope. Then if it's involving the distal parts, the patient could actually have weakness of both lower limbs, um, dizziness uh, as well. Then also on the proximal parts, if the uh, healthy dissection is complicated by uh, tamponade, then the patient can actually uh, uh, faint, I mean, can have syncope and then uh, faint from it. So the examination findings, um, typically the patient's uh, the post rates may be fast trading, blood pressure may be reduced. Most especially if there is a hemodynamic uh, compromise, the um, heart sound, if it's the uh, prosima type, and the patient is already having cardiac tamponade, then the heart sound may actually be more food. Then there may be raised uh, JVP. Then in terms of the blood pressure, the blood pressure uh, there might be a difference between. The two, hand, uh, the two hands, the left and the right, may differ significantly, and that of the hands may also differ from the legs if it's a distal uh, uh, type of uh, aortic dissection. Okay, so in terms of treatment, in acute dissection and in chronic dissection, how do you manage it? In the acute dissection, also depending on the uh, the type the type of uh, uh, dissection we are talking about if it's the prosthema type the definitive treatment is actually surgery while in the uh, this what type of surgery will you do for the prosthema name the surgery i i, I, I don't have the name sir <laughs> i know i know the trend. yeah somebody should give us a name have you heard of, of um, uh, elephant procedure or modify elephant procedure. Yes, sir. Some, some familiar, sir. Okay. okay. Go ahead. So for distal, what is the gold standard of management for distal dissection that it does not involve the prisoner? The most important is to control the blood pressure. So um no first... acute. I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. Acute management of aortic distal dissection. Distal to the what I know of I... left subcravian artery. What is the gold standard in management? Yes, the gold standard is, is... endovascular. Okay, 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 okay. I get it. You can do surgery, but it's endovascular, endovascular. for aortic dissection. Acute easy dissection distal to the uh, to the uh, left subclavian okay. artery is okay. endovascular okay. therapy. Yes. And what type of endovascular will you do? It should be a transcatheter uh, repair. It should be a transcatheter. Transcatheter. I mean, it's a transcatheter procedure. That is why it's endovascular. Yes, sir. Transcatheter repair. We know. So yes. what is the name? I, I, you I, know I understand that is no. Okay, you can, can use Zenet. You can use Zenet. You can also use multi multi layer flow modulator. These okay. are the basic ones that are used here. Zenet graph, Zenet cover graph, multi layer flow modulators are used. Okay. And the vascular is 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 a gold standard. Okay. But now let's go back to the chronic. How will you manage the chronic? The management of the uh, chronic... surgery or endovascular. The chronic uh, descending. Chronic aortic dissection. Surgery? No, no, no. Chronic aortic dissection. Surgery or endovascular, or none of the above. For descending side, it's it's none of the above. It. I'm going to use medical management. Um, among the things I'm going to do is to give. Uh, beta blocker 
uh, can also use uh, calcium, uh, the non dopamine calcium channel for blocker. For those who cannot tolerate a beta blocker, I'm going to use um, anticoagulants because of the risk of uh, uh, thrombosis. What are the things you will do? Yes, sir. I said, I'm going to beta use beta blocker. Uh, I can't hear you, sir. Hello, sir. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you, Professor. Can yeah. You can you hear me, sir? I'm hearing you. Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay, okay, sir. So, so I've said I'm going to use beta blocker. Then, for patient who can know, I'm, I'm hearing you. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, so, for patient who. For patient who cannot tolerate data broker. I okay. am here. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So for patient who cannot tolerate beta blocker, I can use the non -diabetic. I can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So I can yes. use it. Yes, sir. Can we so hear can... Can we hear him? I'm home, sir. I don't know if you can hear me, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So I, I was saying that I'm going to use the medical management, sir. That I'm going to use a beta blocker. And for the patient who cannot okay. beta blocker, I can use the non diabetic calcium channel blocker. Then uh, okay. use anticoagulants because they stand the risk of developing uh, uh, thromboembolism. So I'm going to cancel on uh, physical activities to limit uh, physical activities because it can actually lead to uh, uh, worsening of the, um, uh, the dissection. Then periodically, patient is going to be reviewed. Um, we're going to have a follow-up echo like um every every six months or one year okay that is fine yes, i i think i think i think you have a good idea of aot dissection that is fine i'm okay with that thank you sir. Uh, okay so let somebody else answer this uh dr jaye Dr. Ajaye? Ajaye is not answering also. Chief, um, Dr. Ajaye? Can you hear me, sir? I've been trying to speak since it's network. Can you hear me, sir? Hello? Okay. I'm trying to speak, please. Yes, I can hear you. I can. I can hear you. Okay, sir. Okay, I can hear you now. So this is a 61-year-old uh, man who presented with a 61. Uh, he woke up around 5 a.m. in the morning with acute chest pain and diaphoresis. Acute chest pain and diaphoresis. 
things. So part of the evaluation, this is what you see. This is his ECG and this is the uh, coronary um, um, coron uh, 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 coronary angiography. Yeah, what are you making out of this? Okay, Chief, from the from the ECG. Ah, Chief, the picture has gone, no. but but from from what I had seen so far. There were QS waves in a V1, and there was a ST elevation God, in no, a yeah, Chief is, Chief is out. Hold on for it. Okay. This network now, wow. Okopi, do something about this network now. Yes, Dr. Yes, Chief, I'm here, sir. Can you hear me, sir? So go ahead. Okay. Yes. Chief, um, what I was saying is looking at this ECG, um, I could see I'm trying to expand it, but it's not really coming off. It's so small. But I could I noted that there were QS waves in V1 and there was a ST elevation in V2 to V5, with what looked like um sorry, there were yeah, there were ST elevation in in uh, V2 to V6, I think. V2 to V6. It's not expanding on my distance. So it appears that this patient has an extensive um either an extensive anterior, because I couldn't assess the other leads, either an extensive anterior or an anterior, extensive anterolateral uh, infarction. So which vessel is involved with that SC segment elevation? Um, it would appear to be both the, because I noticed there was some ST elevation also in V6. So I would say, both the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. Now, if it is a pure left anterior descending, which how would the lead in SE segment elevation appear? How would the leads in ST? Yes, which lead will be involved if it is only LAD involvement? Which lead will be involved here? Chief, I think probably just uh, V2 to V2 to V LAD, V2 to V5. V2 to V5, okay. If it is only circumference that is involved, which lead will be affected here? If it is the circumflex, then I would expect um, I would expect V5 and V6 would be involved. And, um, and what? And possibly uh, one and a VL. OK. Now, if it is a right, which vessel will be involved here? 
if it is the right, right coronary. Yeah. See, if it is the right coronary, it would, uh, uh, that would affect the inferior territory. So I would see uh, elevation or changes in uh, lead two, lead three, and AVF. And AVF, okay. So now let me play this thing for you. See what we are seeing here. Which vessel is involved here you are looking at? Chief, please play it again, no? Um, Are you not saying it? Chief, I'm Because this is it. this patient's, yeah, this is this patient ECG, the same patient. Yes, sir. So, so which vessel is this? Chief, um, Chief, this orientation, I'm not, I'm not really certain, but I think the, I think the, that is the LED. Okay. So the mid LED is totally occluded. Are yes, you seeing I, my cursor? Yes, I can see the... Yeah, this the, is where the occlusion is. It's totally yeah, occluded. Chief. At the mid LED, it's totally occluded. Yeah, but Chief, the problem I was having was in identifying... Uh, from this view you gave me, I was trying to see how to identify... From the ECG, yes. But from this... Uh, from this uh, fluoroscopy, this thing, I, I was trying to. I was trying to. I know understand. it will be difficult for you to do so. I know. That was why I was asking you the area involved. Where is it? It's okay, okay. but if any question is to come, it will be very clear so that you'll be able to see each of the view. Maybe we will just we'll, another day. We just use a very short, uh, maybe ten minutes to talk about how to identify each of the vessels. It's okay. Now you have done is you have done because this patient is my patient. I did the PCI for this patient and will revascularize this point. See, so this is an acute MI. So, what would be your strategy for uh, for dual antiplatelet therapy? Yes, go ahead. My strategy for dual uh, platelet therapy would be to commence the patient on a loading dose of um, uh, aspirin, like uh, 300 milligrams start, and then continue- Loading dose of what? Aspirin, aspirin, sir. Aspirin, I want to loading use aspirin- Loading dose of what? Aspirin and clopidogrel. Aspirin and clopidogrel. Ajay. Aspirin and clopidogrel. Aspirin, what is the dose? Clopidogrel, what is the loading dose? Aspirin, what is the loading dose before the procedure? Chief, I will give aspirin of a pre-procedure, 300 milligrams of, uh, 300 to 325 milligrams of aspirin. Uh, um, then yes. Clopidogrel, clopidogrel, 600 milligrams start. Then both Clopidogrel, 300 to 600, please. 300 to 600, please. Yes. Okay, sir. Then um what of then if I'll... assuming wait, assuming you have Tecagri law, what is the loading dose of Tecagri law? Ah sir, I can't remember, sir. I I will check it up, Chief. I can't remember, sir. Chief, sir. 180 milligrams. Hello, Chief, sir. Chief. 
Now, what next work? What kind of thing is this? Am I audible? What can you can hear you? Princess Jack. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Audible. So I think Chief got locked out. Oh, okay. Ah, because I think Chief, uh, Chief, Chief's network too is almost as bad as uh, it's almost as bad as my own. No? <laughs> be like, say, Okopi, they distribute. <laughs> Chief Okopi. Chief, I think Chief was logged out. Too. Yeah, I think Chief was logged out. Because I can't find him here. Yeah, Dr. Ajay. Yes, Chief, sir. Sorry, sir. <clears throat> so, Chief, can you hear me, Chief, sir? Hello, sir. Sorry, yeah. It's my network. My network is here. You go ahead. Okay, Chief, sir. Chief, I was saying that 300 milligrams loading dose of aspirin, 300 to 600 of clopidogrel, the, and the ticagrelo is 180 loading dose. Chief, sir, can you hear me, Chief, sir? Yeah. What of assuming you are um chief i can't hear you sir chief, chief i can't that's correct Chief, I'm sorry, Chief, I didn't well, hear you. Uh, uh, the loading dose is 180. Okay, then assuming you what is the loading dose? Ah, oh. Chief, I don't know the loading dose for Prasso Grello. Hello, Chief, sir. What's the network? I don't even know now. Is it from my end? Hello, Princess J. We can hear you, Dr. Okay, so at least this time is not from my end. Your network is bouncing to yeah. It's We have three major carriers in the country, and none of them is reliable. Now, one. Wow.
Ajaye? My chief. Good evening, yeah, so, yeah, evening. So let's read about the changing. When you are changing from one uh, one uh, uh, antiplatelet to the other, what do you do? In acute and in chronic, please read about it. It's Thank very important also. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So the, yeah, the next question uh, is um, a 45-year-old, uh, please just listen, a 45-year-old uh, lady who presented with a, sh a shortness of breath. And um, this was the echo finding. Uh, doctor, who is the next person going for exam that we have not asked question here? Uh, there are many. We have Dr. Grace Akero Delu. We have Dr. Fatima. Dr. Grace Akero Delu, please, can you answer? Yes, she has gone. But we have Dr. Um, Dr. Atu Shisha. Atu, please, can you respond? Uh, Dr. Grace is around, sorry. Dr. Grace, can you answer? Chief, the picture, the picture is no longer showing, sir. Yes, let me go back. Thank you, sir. Dr. Grace. Dr. Grace. Chief, the picture is still not back, oh, Chief, sir. I know. Dr. Grace, I can Dr. Grace. Dr. Grace. Dr. Grace is not answering you. Oh. Chief, at times, you will not... Chief, at times the network is just simply you you'll be speaking, you they won't hear you and, and things like that. So maybe uh, um, maybe we'll move on to uh, others or who can who we'll can volunteer. yes. Uh Copy. I'll no. volunteer, sir. So Fatima is here. Ajay, Fatima, let's... oh great. Let's, let's yes, give... sir. Yes, so, sir. I'm around. Let's take Fatima. I'm coming. One second. Sir, since, since we have answered yeah. previously. Because I we have a lot of things. I want us to run fast and finish them so that we can rest. Uh let me let me bring forth the uh, the uh, the that particular question again.
Okay, this is it. So a 45 year old uh, lady presented with shortness of breath. These are live cases that we have done. No? Presented with shortness of breath. And uh, this is the echo. Uh, Fatima, what are you seeing here? And what so, further investigation will you do here? Okay, uh, so I can see a mass in the uh, right atrium as well as in the protruding into the right ventricle. It seems to be uh, homogeneous. Okay. So what, uh, what other investigations will you do here? Okay, other investigations I will do uh, include um, uh, contrast echocardiography, which may show uh, uh, increased um, contrast enhancement um, if it's a malignant tumor. If it is benign, it will be partial enhancement compared to the adjacent myocardium. Uh, also, cardiac magnetic resonance may uh, better delineate the mass, um, as well as um, ECG. Uh, yeah, these are the investigations I will do, sir. Okay. Um, what are the complications of this mass? Uh, complications include um, it can of cause heart region, failure. Yeah. Yes, it, okay. it can cause heart failure. It can embolize to cause a stroke. It can also embolize to cause a... Uh, um, um, I, it can cause um, atrial fibrillation. Um, it can also uh, cause uh, symptoms of um, obstruction across the tricuspid valve being um, in the right heart. So a patient may come with uh, symptoms of tricuspid valve uh, occlusion. It can also cause pulmonary embolism. Okay. Mm. Okay, the next question is that what would be indication for cardiac biopsy in this case? Um, so if um, there is inconclusive, so doing endocardial biopsy, you said? What would be indications for endo, for cardiac biopsy in this case? Okay, or generally? So what are the indications for cardiac biopsy generally? Let me extend the question for you. Okay, indications for doing um, endomyocardial biopsy is uh, when a patient has a heart failure of unknown origin, um, patient having infiltrative um, cardiac diseases like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, or uh, um, cardiac transplant patients to rule out um, acute uh, rejection as well as um, presence of cardiac tumors that are... Uh, which um, is one of these. Yes, which is an this is an atrial myxoma, which is one of them. Also, um, in patients with giant cell myocarditis or fulminant lympho lymphocytic myocarditis are also indications for doing endomyocardial biopsy. Well, endomyocardial biopsy. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Fine. What are the techniques of cardiac biopsy? Uh, the techniques. Um, how will you prepare the patient, and how will you go about the biopsy? Yeah, uh, patient preparation involves uh, patient education. Um, doing uh ECG echo, um, clotting profile, full blood count to make sure that uh, all, all is safe. Then um, doing um, echocardiography to confirm the ejection fraction of the patient before taking uh, the patient. Approach can be either. Uh, into the right heart or into the left heart, depending on where the lesion is. Um, if it's uh, to the right heart, the approach will be via um, transfemoral vein, um, mostly. Uh, if it's um, to the left heart, it will be through the transfemoral uh, uh, artery. Okay, so I should describe the procedure of endomyocardial biopsy? Yes, correct. Okay, 
Um, so um, during the catheterization, uh, when you uh, puncture, you prepare the patient, you uh, drip the site, sterilize it, then um, um, put the patient to uh, sedation. After which you apply, um, you inject a local anesthetic agent like one percent lidocaine. Um, you um, I will sterilize the site. Then I will pass my catheter. Uh, yeah. I will pass my catheter, then the biopton will be passed through this um, catheter under fluoropid guidance um, and also ECG guidance. So as um, I'm approaching into the, if I'm doing um, the right heart catheterization, that is in the case where I want to biopsy the right heart. Um, when I enter into the uh, right atrium, I will pass through the triphosphate valve um, in most cases, the intravenous septum is usually um, the, that is biopsy. So um, when the biopsy, as I'm pro, uh, um, as I'm um, deciding the biopsy, I will make sure that the tip is closed until when it gets uh, contact with the intravenous septum. After which I will then, um, which will be shown on the ECG by presence of uh, PVCs. Then I will just uh, move it um, a little uh, back. Then I will open the mouth of the and then um, progress it again. Then I will capture and close, that is close the biopsy. After which I will remove it and uh, put it inside formalin and then heparin to make sure that I'm not uh, taking clot back into the heart. This I will repeat for like uh, five to six samples and the cardiac tissue is usually uh, pinkish in color. Um, so if it's whitish, then it may, it's not likely to be a uh, cardiac tissue. So I will, uh, I will repeat this uh, procedure about uh, five to ten to make sure that I get adequate um, tissue for the biopsy. I will also involve uh, a team who will be organized at uh, up initial involving the cardiologists, the interventional uh, cardiologists, as well as the histopathologists and the nurses. So the histopathologists will be around to look at the tissue and then um, proceed to uh, examining it. Uh, what are the complications of cardiac biopsy? Yes, uh, um, complications include um, excessive uh, bleeding, embolization, um, risk of uh, uh, cardiac perforation with uh, cardiac tamponade, uh, shock, um, acute, uh, shock with uh, acute kidney injury, um, as well as uh, risk of stroke from embolism. Risk of stroke from embolism. Okay. Uh, there's something you didn't mention. You yes. said that during right arm catheterization, you are going to catheterize this patient. You are going to catheterize from the femoral. Am I right? Is that femoral vein? Yeah, femoral vein. Am I right? Yes, sir. That's what I said. Good. I want you to watch this biopsy and tell us which approach did I use here. Which approach is that? It's a right heart approach. No, is it femoral vein that I use here? Which it's approach is that? Internal jugular vein. Internal jugular vein. So why did you mention it? So it seems the data is coming from above. I thought it's internal jugular vein, you are right. I said, why did you mention it? So I forgot to mention it. It's okay. Then you Thank talk you. about under fluoroscopy. Why did you add echocardiography? This patient that we biopsy here, I did this biopsy. This patient that we biopsy here, we use both echo and the fluoroscopy to do the biopsy. Every other thing you mentioned is okay. 
Then you also talk about um, left heart biopsy uh, going through the the femoral artery. Yeah, which other which other can you use? Um, so I'm not sure. You can use your brachial access too. Brachial uh, brachial artery access. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That is good. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, who next? Fatima, can you still answer? Yes, sir. A fifty-two year old um, a fifty-two year old um, man presented with acute chest pain, and you went in for the angiogram. This is what you see, you saw. Please, can you identify what is on the board? This one is too high for you, I think so. <laughs> Actually, no, it's too high. Actually, what happened here is that we were thinking that the lady, uh, sorry, the man had um, um, uh, had uh, acute coronary syndrome, but when we tried to engage, we could not engage. So we have to use multi-purpose catheter to engage here. It's too high for you. Don't even memorize it because you are not going to see it in exam. So we use multi-purpose catheter and we notice that the left coronary artery is coming from the right. So if you see my cursor, this is the right coronary artery. Why this is the left coronary artery came from the right and transverse between the two great vessels. That was what happened here. So the lady was re referred for surgery. Okay, question 13. List five procedures that you can refer to this center. Copy. John. John. Hello, sir. List five procedures that you can refer to this center. Okay, the center that can that have facilities. This like this look like yes. a center that have facilities for an open heart surgery or a cardiothoracic surgery. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, I can refer a patient that will require a CRT, a patient that requires heart transplant, a patient that requires valve repair, any form of valve repair, a patient that requires a left um, device therapy for heart failure and a patient that will require um, um, surgical intervention for um, um, pericardial diseases like um, constrictive pericarditis and also for, okay, a tamponade or pericardial okay. diseases. Um, also a patient that, um, Mm. Pacemaker insertion, yeah. Pacemaker insertion is open heart surgery. The answer is no. No. Okay. I thought you said what can be referred for this this center. Okay. All right. Um, pericardial diseases like constrictive pericarditis, heart transplant. Constrictive pericarditis. Yes. Please know the heart echo finding, John. We should know the echo yeah. finding of constrictive pericarditis. So. Yes, Patients sir. with constrict pericarditis know their echo findings. They are very, very tricky questions there. Yes. Yes, sir. yes sir. I also said about heart transplants. I also said about valvular heart repair. I also said about congenital heart, um, yes. both um, cyanotic or cyanotic congenital. What repair. of bypass? Okay, bypass too, sir. Yes. What are the types of bypass? At least you are a cardiologist. 
the cardio cardio sorry sir, I, i'm not sure if i get the question clearly the what are the of types of bypass okay i don't think i have that clearly in my mind you can no bypass can be off pump or on pump okay in nigeria we do uh on pump uh, bypass off pump bypass you don't need hard long machine for it okay. on pump you need a hard long machine for on pump bypass okay mm -hmm. so, on pump on pump on um, pump and okay. on pump bypass then what how do you prepare a patient for a bypass please Preparing the patient for a bypass, <laughs> first and foremost, I would want to counsel the patient and explain the procedure to the patient and then tell the patient the possibility, the outcomes of the bypass. Uh, I want to do a basic... First of all, uh, indication for the bypass. What are the indications for bypass? What are you going to see on the angiogram that will make you think of a bypass? That will make you call Dr. Sanusi and Dr. Falashe. Long oh, segment. Long segment. Uh, if the depending, if it is a three vessel disease, I want to three vessel up. disease. Well, yeah. Okay, three vessel disease, but it has to be what you have to qualify it. Non stentable three vessel disease because a patient can just have just okay. tubular 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 segment and you can put three stents and it ends there. Okay, oh. reverse two diseases. Yeah. Next one. Okay, sir. And if the extent, if the extent of this, the um, the best, the best two diseases. That's one. Um. um if it involves the left main. Left main, yeah, left main, yes. Mm. Uh, if it be, uh, if the second very long and cannot be stent, mm. left main. Left main qualify because you know not every left main is for a bypass. There are some there uh, if a diabetic has left main, is mm. better with bypass. They do better with bypass than surgery. Okay. Sorry, they do better better with bypass than stenting. Mm. Diabetic left main. Then if the left main is um uh, is bifurcation left main. That is at the point of where you have um, the, the LED ostium and um, sacrophane ostium. Mm. They also do better with um, they also do better with with bypass. But at the end of the day, is um, um, is um, individual preference because there are some patients whom by use uh, by reason of the of um by reason of the involvement of the vessel you wanted a bypass but um they they decline bypass and they opt for for surgery so it is the hard team decision so always anytime you come into the issue of bypass and and um and pci always Discuss it on the basis of hard team discussion. I me mean, hard team decision. Don't discuss it only on the perspective of the uh, of the cardiothoracic surgeon or the perspective of the interventional cardiology. Rather, discuss it on the perspective of the hard team uh, discussion. I'm sorry, a hard team agreement. What did the hard team agree on to do for that case? And also the patient pref uh, preference, the patient, the heart team discussion must also involve 
the patient's preference. All the options are valuable and the patient can choose. And whatever the patient choose, you must also tell the patient uh, the complications the, uh, that may encounter with that particular procedure before you move ahead with it. Mm? Yes, sir. So read more about uh, bypass. Um, the, the what the what the cardiology should do to prepare that patient because I prepared a number of patients for OCZ way for a bypass. Read more about it and know what the surgeon needs and what the surgeon want to hear from you before he finally take that patient for a bypass. Okay, so time because we still have more questions to look at. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, let's look at this. This is, uh, what is this? Um, Jacqueline? This is the subcutaneous ICD. Yeah, okay, Dr. Godia, this is a subcute uh, sub ICD, correct? So what are the indications for it? Dr. Godia. Dr. Godia, what are the indications for it for subcutaneous ICD? John. Hello, sir. Yeah, what are the indications for subcutaneous ICD? So I will give subcutaneous ICDs for malignant, malignant arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. If it is acute. Are you serious? <laughs> no, sir. Uh, but you have the normal ICD now. Why would sir, you go I... for normal? Why would you go for transvenous ICD? Why are you doing subcutaneous ICD? You are talking about ICD generally, primary and secondary indication. I'm sure, I'm sure that is what you are trying to say. But okay, so... what are the specific indications for subcute SICD? Okay, I I would have to check that out. Okay, um, but if anybody okay. can, uh, uh, Jacqueline, yes, sir. Indication for so, uh, SICD. Yes, sir. Um, someone that has uh, maybe an unfavorable anatomy such that you can't assess the right atrium, maybe a patient that has a um, an obstruction uh, is, of the superior vena cava. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. Uh, obstruction of the superior vena cava. Okay. Maybe where we can't, no, no, for, yes, maybe where we cannot assess if there's an obstruction to the vessel going into the right atrium that we okay. cannot implant the device. Then okay. also if there's an infection, like someone that has an infective endocarditis. Yes. Infection, yeah. yes, infection, yeah. pocket yeah. infection, uh, yeah. infective endocarditis, yes, I agree with yeah. you in all, all those one. Yeah. yeah, what else? But what, 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 what obstruction is that? No, that's your number one. Let's quantify that obstruction. What type of obstruction is that? One? Um. So maybe I should um, think of another possibility. Maybe a patient that has a tricuspid stenosis that tricuspid cannot stenosis. access the right ventricle without okay. uh, in, uh, without triggering maybe a, a, a regurgitation. Mm -hmm. No, be quantifying very well. Eh? You know there are some patients that have um, that have um, a tricuspid valve repair. Yes, sir. I've seen them that have tricuspid valve repair. 
Because if you if a patient has a tricuspid valve repair and um, any form of repair you do in the tricuspid valve that involve implant um, implantation of um, either um, any of the a prosthetic valves on the tri tricuspid valve area it's make it difficult for you to pass through that tricuspid. So you will go for subcutaneous ICD. I agree with you on that. Okay, so what is the procedure? How do you implant the subcutaneous ICD? Yes, I think um, a pocket is created in the subcutaneous piece around the, the lateral chest wall or the, the abdomen, the, around the lateral aspect of the abdomen or the lateral chest wall. And then the, a tunnel is created to tunnel the, the catheter to the point where it makes contact. It makes contact with the heart so that it can transmit impulses to the heart. Mm. Make contact with the heart. Oh, no, you don't make contact with the heart. As you said, you create a po you create a pocket. Are you seeing my cursor here? Yes, sir. Yeah, in the lateral wall, you prepare the patient sterilely, create a pocket here, and when you dissect this pocket, you get to the latissimal dorsi. There is a muscle here called the latissimal dorsi. You you create you you go down to the latissimal dorsi, then be between the latissimal dorsi and the and the uh, and the next layer of muscle, you split in between, and this battery has to go in between that. Okay. So it's not you don't leave this subcutaneous. I mean you don't leave the, leave it. Uh, on top of the latissimum, you bury it between the two layer of muscles in between. That is where you bury this. Then you now come to the next point where my cursor is. Then you take another dissection to a uh, dissection to get to the uh, to the fascia before the uh, before the uh, before the the muscles that is on top of the ribs you don't go below the uh, uh, below the uh, the muscles of the of the ribs that is on top that is from the skin you dissect down to the muscle then you now create a tunnel just as you create your tunnel in dialysis you create a tunnel from this pocket in the lateral point and you boss it out here, bring out the lead here, then create another tunnel under, under the skin, create another tunnel straight by the, by the left side of the sternum, create a tunnel under the skin. So that this tunnel, the aim here is that the, the, this part of this lid, that is the, the coil, should enter in this second tunnel. So you create it and you bury it. Once you create it, you take out the, uh, uh, the, uh, you take out the dilator under the skin, take out the dilator, then uh, um, push this coil into it and split out the pillar with sheet. Then you close here, then you come back and connect it to the generator, then close here. That is all about subcut ICD. But one thing about subcut ICD is that it does not pace, please. So it's, it does not pace. It's only used for defibrillation and at uh, yeah, defibrillation. It is not used for bradycardia pacing, please. It doesn't do the work of bradycardia pacing, unlike 
the transvenous ICD that you can use for bradycardia pacing. So if patient become bradycardia, you can pace. A patient has um, a tachycardia, you can do anti-tachycardia, and you can do also uh, defibrillation or cardioversion. This can only be used for the uh, for the tachycardia therapy. Cannot be used for bradycardia therapy. Note that. So the the use the limitations are are are, are more. Sorry, the the limitations are much. So the the reason for subcute ICDs are really limited, especially when the patient has uh, infections and there is no need to repeat another transvenous. Patient has either pocket infection or endocarditis from the previous insertion, and uh, or the patient um, the patient had uh, patient had um, a repair of the tricuspid valve or obstructions or inability to uh, properly position a transvenous um, 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 lead, you have to go for this in order to protect that patient against latter arrhythmias. Okay, so we we'll talk about indication, contraindication, Sorry, describe the procedure, list the complications. I think this is the way we should go. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to find out what form of anesthesia is the patient going to have? Is it GA? Can you can do it. If you are doing it, um, if you are doing it in uh, Nigeria, you can just you can just go give a common sedation and you take it. Sometimes a patient may just require a GA just for the comfort of that patient. GA because of the comfort of that patient. If not, just like, uh, have you done um, toilet, line, toilet line for dialysis? Yes, I've, I've uh, assisted. So it's similar. But you can just because of because of the comfort of the patient, there are some patients that they don't want to be awake in any form. You can give them GA, but the idea thing is that um, adequate local anesthesia and my sedation is sufficient for it. My sedation here I means you can give uh, midazolam, diazepam if you have that, then adequate uh, local anesthesia. That is fine. Okay, so no all, note all this in case. Now, the next question is, I think we have discussed this before. You should know the indication for this uh, device and also the complication that may arise from it and describe the procedure. Am I right? Yes, sir. Good. Copy. Yes, sir. We're here, sir. So I'm just checking the subcutaneous ICD. Funny enough, I'm just getting to know. I just checked the American Heart Association guidelines. Uh, what did they say that we didn't say? You know, I'm just summarizing it. If you go and read it, you'll get more facts about it. Yes, yes, sir. So when okay. we finish, because we have many things to cover, I just want to expose you to all as much as possible. Mm? Uh, so that, that, that anyhow you are being pushed, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to come out of it. The key thing about it is that the MCQ and the clinical tie to get they tie them together. So the clinical is one of the areas that you can use to dismantle that exam. The clinical you can get 35 over 50 for the clinical. The MCQ is over 50. The clinical is over 50. So um, you can get 35, 40 in the clinicals. You can score as high as that. So if you get like 40 or you get 35 in the clinical, it's impossible for you to fail that exam because the the pass mark for clinical is 25. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So if you get 35, 
you have extra ten to buffer from anywhere. That is to buffer for the book hardly fill anybody. Just organize your book. Well, I will still have a little time to talk with you guys about the book. Book hardly fill anybody. Just organize yourself. Know how to talk. Know how to understand the the language of the examiner when they want to get something and know how to give it to them. And I'm sure a lot of corrections that you have made um, get all of them set. The book hardly fill anybody. Hardly does the book fill anybody, except maybe that book is really, really, really bad, which. I know at this point, nobody can get that out for the exam. So the trick is that combine these two together, hit it very hard. That is how you pass the, the clinical, combine the clinical to the, to the MCQ. So when, once you score that very high, you can score 30, assuming you didn't even score well for clinical, aim at 30, 35. If you fall below, maybe 28, 30. So that's the other marks can, can help you a lot. Okay, so Hello, sir. this procedure will know this. Yes, Hello, any sir. question? I don't uh, know. Go ahead. I don't know about this clinical because most of the results I've been seeing, well, I hardly see anybody score above 28, 29 in the, in the oral. All right. No, look at it. Somebody can score 30. Somebody can score above that. Is the clinical is this. What the questions are going to span through. Um, we will still have another session before you go. Uh, let me ask one or two uh, examiners and, and get their tips on this issue. Okay. So maybe I will share with you guys. Mm. All right. Yeah, so you should just know all this. Yeah, very good. So these are the for the LV need positioning. Wow. This is the case we did today. This case was done today. You can see how the this is the coronary sinus. What you see here is the coronary sinus. You can see that the lead is coming in. Today is 28. This case was done today afternoon. So now, there is something I want to show you here. If you look at this image, this is, this, is the vein, this is the vein that will enter. This is the posterior lateral vein that will enter. There is a vein that moves like this. There are two ways. Either you enter this vein or you enter from here. This is the mid cardiac vein that feel this way. So what I have, these are the only two options I have in this coronary sinus, if you look at it. If you go and position the uh, that lead here, you will not get any benefit for that, that patient. If you enter this vein, you will not get any benefit. Enter here, enter here, the patient is a disaster. So you, it's not just positioning that lead. You must know the vein that will help that patient. There are only two veins here. If you look at from the angiogram, sorry, the venogram, this and this, and we went for this and were very successful. If this was not successful, the next option is to go for this one and, and go down like this. That is all for that patient. And you can see it here going in. So at the end of the day, this is what we enter. 
You can see it very clear here. Okay. Very good. Um, who will answer this? Uh, Dr. John, who else is going for exam? I want somebody to answer this um, venticlogram. There are many here. No, they call somebody out. Call somebody out. Let the person answer us. Okay, sir. Doctor... Well, I mean West Africa. West Africa. Oh, okay. Dr. Ajayi? Akero Dulu, I don't know. She's not responding. Akero Dulu has answered a question. No, let, let Akero Dulu talk. Dr. Akero Dulu? She has not answered any question yet. Let's yes, see. let him talk. Doctor, okay, there's one person here, Dr. Um, Atu, Atu, and Dr. Folash Ade, too. Dr. Folash Ade? Dr. Folash Ade? Mm, Folash Ade is not answering also. Uh, what of Fatima? Dr. Fatima? That's yes, sir. Uh, Please go man. ahead. Okay. This patient, yes, I don't know. If this patient is um, is a twenty five year yeah. old. He presented with um, with uh, recurrent chest pain and palpitation, and uh, um, this is part of the left heart catheterization. What are you seeing? And what do you think? What is the next investigation you will do? Let's start from there. <laughs> uh, so what I'm seeing is uh, like an impeller device. Impeller device? <laughs> I better go and show you guys the impeller device. Please don't go there. This is not an oh, impeller yeah. device. This is this is um, uh, a pig tail catheter. It's not a pillar device. If I show you pillar oh. device, it's different from this. Oh, okay. So I've never seen it. Good. Can you try? Or who else can make a try? Yeah. So, okay. Did you get the question? 25 year old with recurrent chest pain. 25 recurrent chest pain. And um, um part of the left heart catheterization, we did a ventriculogram, and this is what we saw. What is what do you think is the diagnosis and what are the differentials? And what is the next investigation you want to do? And how will you manage this patient? Okay, so let me try. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Okay, so this left ventriculography is actually showing um, this page-shaped appearance. Yes. Left ventricle, correct. Which is characteristic of a trophic cardiomyopathy. Yes. What is the Japanese name for that? Um, Yamaguchi syndrome. Yamaguchi, Yamaguchi cardiomyopathy. Yeah, Yamaguchi um, ca cardiomyopathy. Yes. So I would like to do an echocardiogram for this patient if it hasn't been done. Uh, echocardiogram is that what the next you will do? Echocardiogram okay. is fine, but it, it will not give you what we want here. What is the next? You have escalated to that point. What is the next test you will do? Yes, I, I would like to know what the pressures are in the heart. And also, also an MRI would help me too. MRI, correct. An MRI. MRI. Mm -hmm. You would do an MRI. The next that the next investigation is MRI. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Very good. It's MRI. That is what you will do. So how will you manage this case? 
Okay, um, these patients has an apical form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is having yes. symptoms. Apical hocum, yes. Yeah, so I would like to evaluate um these patients to know whether there is um evidence of um I would like to actually know whether this patient is having arrhythmias that is complicating this um, cardiomyopathy. I would like to do a, a baseline ECG. I would like to do a whole time monitoring. And if there's evidence that the patient has arrhythmias, probably atrial fibrillations or ventricular arrhythmias, then I want to place this patient on an antiarrhythmic agent, um, a, a rate control agent or a rhythm control agent. Now, being that the patient has an apical form of hocum. The patient doesn't usually have, um, they don't typically have the um, complications of obstruction, which happens in the other forms of hocum. So a lot of times the patients will not, um, they have less risk of uh, sudden cardiac deaths compared to the obstructive form of hocum. But if a patient actually is having some of these arrhythmias that is, is troublesome and is life-threatening, I would place this patient on rhythm or rate control agents. And then if it persists, a patient has um, maybe a history, family history of uh, sudden cardiac deaths from, from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or patient is having um, syncopal attacks. I'll look at the patients um, in, in totality and, and decide whether patient will benefit from a device therapy like an ICD. Um, therapy. Um, then patients would also require, if a patient has a complication, since the patient is having a weakness, if I remember from the question, the patient has an atrial fibrillation, which is the commonest complication in um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, commonest arrhythmia in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then I would um, consider placing the patient on um, um, anticoagulation therapy as well to prevent some of the complications that happen. But most times they are, their risk for mortality is, 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 is lower than that in obstructive, even though it's higher than in the general population. So okay. I'll manage conservatively as much as possible. It's okay. So that is fine. So um, I think uh, we can, yeah. Um, who will answer this? Uh, this is a 86-year-old man who presented with a progressive shortness of breath and chest pain. So he was evaluated and this procedure was done. Which procedure is this? And yeah. Can you describe it and what are the complications of the procedure? Somebody should try. Dr. Jaye? Dr. Jaye? My chief, chief, I don't even know what I'm seeing, you know. <laughs> Dr. Godia. No, Dr. Godia. No, 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 no. Dr. Godia. Dr. Godia. Dr. Kopi. Dr. Kopi. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Kopi, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead, attempt the question. 85. Mm. I said he presented with chest pain and progressive uh, dyspnea. And in the course of evaluation and management, this procedure was done. Can you explain what you are seeing? And you describe the procedure. How will you walk up this patient for this procedure? 
So I release the die again. Let me see. So is it an um an aortic aneurysm? I don't think so. The patient in failure, then it could be a, a, an intra aortic balloon pump. Mm. I don't know. See, that is another thing that they can ask, so please. Intra aortic balloon pump. I hope you know intra aortic balloon pump. Oh. This is not intra aortic balloon pump. No, I don't know. <laughs> no. Okay, so is it possible that the patients may um exactly can you answer let that okay, so try say a tavi this is tavi so you have been describing tavi so if they show you to you won't know it i have not seen it before <laughs> this is tavi mm. This is balloon expandable valve. That is what is okay. here. Are you not seeing that this valve, this uh, valve was deployed was deployed with balloon? Are you not seeing the balloon? This is balloon I've expandable not, valve. There I've are two types of valves: self-expanding valve and balloon expandable valve. Please note them all for Tavi. Okay, sir. Okay, so since uh, okay, I sir, think this. So, sir, in describing the procedure, what would it look like in describing it in case we say? I, I think it, it may be too deep for you. I think it's too deep. Let's not corrupt your brain. <laughs> Let's not go there. I think it may be too deep. Leave it. All Let's right, go for you. this. Mm. Let somebody right. explain. This is an ECG of um of um 76 year old um male who presented to you at follow up what reading is this and what next will you do Ajay? Chief, I'm looking at it, so. Um, well, um, Chief, um, let me, the things I have seen so far, um, the the rhythm, the rhythm is is normal. Well, what I mean is that the rate, the rate is just slightly less than hundred. That's about uh, maybe about ninety four. Then the the rhythm. The rhythm appears to be sinus, but there is um there appears to be P wave uh, prolongation. The, sorry, the PR interval appears to be prolonged. Then there are um I can see I can see what looks like okay, I can see ST. Let me see. In this V. In this V1, there appears to be some ST elevation with the QS waves from V, V1, V2, V3, V4. So V1 to V4, there are obvious ST elevation with, um, with uh, Q waves, with QS waves rather, and there is a there is a this 
yeah, discordance. There is discordance ST elevation from V1 to V, um, from V1 to V4. So, um, so Chief, it looks like this patient has, um, this patient has an acute coronary syndrome involving uh, mostly the left anterior descending. Um, if so. Mm -hmm. Any different opinion? Chief, I'm seeing what looks like ST elevation from V1 to V4. Mm. Deep. Any different opinion? Yes, sir, the patient is presenting on follow up. Yes. Okay, this patient appears to have... What reading is this? Is it a sinus reading? And what next will you do? Sorry, sir, I missed the actual history the patient gave me, but this I patient... I said it's a 78-year-old has... lady who presented to you in the clinic on the course of follow-up. No symptom. But you requested for the ECG, and this is what was found. What is this reading? And what next will you do? Yes, sir. It's a sinus reading with a complete left one to branch block. So for this patient, I would like to know whether she has a um, underlying structural heart disease because this suggests that and to know whether she has a her ejection fraction is reduced. So if she does have a reduced ejection fraction, I would like to um, consider this patient for, well, she's asymptomatic. <laughs> She's asymptomatic, she's on follow up. Well, if her ejection fraction is reduced, I want to consider a CRT for this for patient. It, for asymptomatic patient then. <laughs> so can I, uh, can I give it a try too? Yes, go ahead. So this patient may have an MI. That is fine. So I want to compare with the previous ECG if this patient had one. Mm. Okay. Hello, sir. I'm hearing you. Go ahead. Okay, I said I want to compare with the previous ECG if the patient had one. It is a new left bundle branch block, so I'll consider the possibility of an MI. And then I want to Let, let's go into this issue of new left bundle branch block. Look, I've seen a lot of new left bundle branch block, and I've okay. done coronary angiogram for them. Their cardiology referred them to me. I did their coronary angiogram, and it's perfectly normal. So what I wanted to say on this issue of new left bundle branch block equivalent of MI, it is not true. Absolutely, okay, that is a rubbish statement. It is not true. Okay, it is not. There are many things that can give you new yes, left bundle branch block, especially when that heart dilates. Many yes, things sir. can give that. So yes, many sir. things can cause dilatation of a heart. So 
Once it dilates, a bonding branch, sorry, uh, LBB can occur. So leave that matter. Focus on this ECG. What is this reading? This is not sign. This is not sinus reading. There's something you are missing on this ECG. Okay, the P wave is occurring after the caries complex, and it's inverted. Is there any P wave that occur after caries complex here? Which lead is that? Okay, no, I'm not seeing well. Sorry, sir. I'm just enlarging it. It's not there. This patient has a pacemaker reading. This, this is a patient who had a complete heart block and was referred to us at UPTH. We now put a dual chamber pacemaker for the patient. And after that, the patient came on a follow-up and this issue was done. And this is what we saw on that ECG. So this patient has what? LBB that is induced by pacemaker. This is how it looks like. Yeah, really. So, <laughs> you didn't even see the pacemaker spike. Probably that's one of the things that confused us. Yes, <laughs> I know. The pacemaker spikes, spikes, no? It is not every ECG or every pacemaker that will generate a pacemaker spike. The pacemaker spikes are seen mostly in patients with unipolar uh, configuration. Once the pacemaker is a unipolar, unipolar means that the, the, the anode is in the heart, while the cathode it has to do with the can. So you the can the, the, the can has to make contact with the body to complete that circuit. So you have a long way to complete that uh, that circuit. Unlike the bipolar that just had um, both the uh, anode, which is in contact with the heart, and the cathode just a very few millimeter away uh, from the uh, from the anode. In that case, you will not see a spike on the EKG on the ECG. But how do you know? Is this? You know when number one. If you look at this ECG here, look at V one. Sorry, look at lead one. Lead one is classically is classically telling you that this patient has LBB. So you one of your first differential is pacemaker induced. Look at lead one. Then look at V1. If you look at V1, V2, V3, V4, they are all you see that more of Q uh uh, QS, 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 that is what you see in this pattern. So you don't really see arrow. Then when you come to V5 and V6, you see more of arrow. You see more of arrow and you don't really see S. If you look at, um, if you look at, uh, if you look at the term, the progression of the arrow wave here, you notice that there is even no arrow wave in V1, V2, V3, V4. Suddenly, you now see very prominent arrow wave in V5 and V6 without seeing the S wave. Take more of pacemaker uh, LBB. So this is a pacemaker. There are other pattern of LBB. If you look at other pattern of LBB, you don't really see this particular order I described. That somebody can just go and bring um, a pacemaker ECG. Now, bringing a pacemaker ECG can come in two ways. You somebody can bring the one that we have the spike on it is easy. 
even everybody can identify that spike and you will call it a, a pacemaker reading. But it's also a pacemaker reading where you will not see any of this spike. The reason, the reason why you don't see the spike, as I said, is because away from themselves. So the circuit is completed in a ECG. But how you describe it, you will just see uh, the LBB as we describe here. Then you see the Q, S, Q, S, Q, S, suddenly it disappear. You see arrow, arrow, arrow. That is how you identify this. So those are the things I could have, I was watching out for that. Somebody will see that, ah, this one look like a pacemaker uh, reading. These are the reasons, one, two, three, and you move on. So you must not see the spikes before you see it. So now when you go back, Check, uh, check for pacemaker ECG, uh, the normal ones, the one that don't have any issue. Check for them, the one you can see spike and the one you won't see spike. And um, the new, the newest one that the newest one that they are producing are the current list that have been produced now. Most of them are bipolar, and the configuration of the of the anode and the cathode is just very fractions of millimeter away from each other. And you will not see these spikes when you do an ECG on a patient who carry these devices. Any further question before we move on? Any question? Any question? No, sir. Okay, good. So the next thing is, um, I'm sure you have, um, you all know everything about uh, a 24, a 24 hour BP monitors. I hope we know all about it. If they bring a machine, 24-hour BP monitor, I hope we can recognize it. I think so. so depending on the make, yeah. some makes are very, very funny. But the one we are used to, we can identify it. Well, I don't know. Very good. At least you can identify some. That is good. So just, but do you know how you, you, you take the recording how the procedure is done and how you interpret the result. Copy. Yes, sir. So some uh, large extent, but we can still learn more from you, sir. If there's any trick about it, sir. Uh, about about it is that um, I think is the usual. Uh, you look at, you know, the BP is, uh, it depends on how you set the machine. In the day, it's usually set shorter than in the night. In the day, depending on what you are setting, you can set it to read every 20, 20 minutes in the day. Why in the night? In the night here, it depends on how you set your night. If you are going, if most time you are going to bed by 10 o'clock, you can set the night from uh, maybe nine or ten o'clock, and the uh, time is uh, around five thirty-six a.m. in the morning. So, and that period, it may not be reading every thirty thirty minutes. So, but remember how you prepare the machine before you apply it to the patient, and what are the uh, the indications that you need it for. So, one of it, which uh, I know you know many of those indications, but one of it is uh, for chronotropic therapy of your medications. Uh, chronotropic therapy here is uh, 
you want to find out because we run a psychiatric reading. So you want to find out when within the 24 hour this BP is highest so that you can target, you can give medication that can target that period of time. That is the chronotropic therapy. And there also, there are people who had nocturnal hypertension, people who had, um, uh, who are, they are BP uh, salivated at home, but in the office, the BP is normal. Uh, those that have a white coat effect, then those that have white coat hypertension, to resolve all that, you need this uh, uh, ambulatory blood pressures to do that. Then those that you give drugs and um, you think the drugs are not controlling the BP, especially if you want to exclude a, a pseudo a hypertension, this is all that you need to do in order to get the a good result for them. So the ability is to ability to interpret the data. Then also know your dipping, what is uh, diastolic dipping, what is systolic dipping. I think these are the things that you need uh, to uh, answer most of the questions that will revolve around that. And how do you interpret the data as a whole? I think that is all. Maybe except you have a question, we'll move to the next. No, sir, I think that's very clear for me. I don't know if any other person has a question. Ajayi. Then the same thing, the same thing also apply to uh, the same thing. We will so round up for today. So I'm sure we have spent time uh, before twelve. We are going to round up. Uh, the same thing also apply to uh, people people that are going for twenty four hour uh, ECG. There is something I could have shown you guys, but I didn't show it because we don't, it's, all, it's only my center that we do it in the country. That is a, a cardiac loop recorders. All those are investigations in cardiology. How do you implant it? I could have shown you some pictures, asked you to talk about it, talk about the procedure, but I don't think anybody should ask you that because it is not routinely done in the country. It's only, only my center where we do it. So it's not widely available in the country. So I don't want to talk about it. So these are the, the, the issues that you must raise. Know your investigation because there will be an, at least one station on investigation. Know your ECG because at least there will be a question on ECG. Know your clinical um, uh, scenario because there will be at least one or two questions that will be painted around uh, clinical scenario like hypertension, heart failure. So hypertension, what are the non... Uh, one of the things I usually tell people apart from the medication, what are the non-drug uh, uh, therapy that are valuable, you must, those are things that uh, even in NCS, there, there was so much discussion around it. So know all those stuff. Then um, apart from hypertension, your echo, yes, your ECG, yes. Then remember also your speckle tracking. Know that they do a lot of speckle tracking in the battle. So just know that it can it can form a question. And how do you revolve? Around all those the theoretical aspect of it. If they show you the image, it's going to be like uh, a uh, bull eye. I think that is the one they will show to you. How do you acquire the image? So you should just read around all that. That is for echo. Then the the some of the image we show may also be relevant. Then uh, remember last year they asked you endomyocardial biopsy. 
You know, that is an, in, in, that is an investigation in cardiology. So this year, who knows what? They will ask, is it but dear cardiology? So this is how you think around the cardiology round clock. So it tells you that most time the question they will ask are things that we see here. We see here. Uh, read around them and uh, be able to identify those uh, common, the very clear coronary artery, left, right left main, uh, left anterior descending, um, uh, circumference. You should be able to identify all those common commands and then uh, move on. So the next one we're going to have, I want, I will talk to the, the ACLA guru to discuss with us the various protocol uh, in the, in the ACLS and each of the protocol, when do you apply the drugs? What do you do at each of the stages and the rest? I think I will talk with you so that Monday we can have it. And uh, I always wish you guys the very best of all. Thank you so much. Is there much sir? Any question? Thank you so much, Chief, sir. Uh, thank thank you. you, sir. Yeah, we thank God. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh -huh. thank you. Uh, is there any question? Godia, any question? John, uh, Jacqueline, Ajay, uh, Fatima, Adibi, Obasanjo. All oh, these are guys that talk to the guys. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. yes. we will go and read around all what you have said, and we will. We will try and uh, improve on the on the quality of this. Yeah, don't don't read one and leave the other. Marry everything together because you need the MCQ to combine with your clinicals. The two has to go together. You know, somebody asked uh, to me uh, today that you have not seen uh, anything uh, more than twenty eight. So I will find out because it might uh, the the clinical if you score twenty you know if you score twenty eight in the clinical that is that is a mighty mark. Share you know, uh, Doctor Kopi. Share you know. Yep. Yes, I, yeah, it's a mighty. Somebody get twenty eight. That is a really big mark. In fact, I've not seen any. All the scores I've been seeing, I hardly see 28. It's 27 maximum I've seen, sir. <laughs> I don't know. In my time, I saw 28. I think so. I can't remember a geisha. So, no problem. It's okay. It's, you will get it. Don't worry. Amen. Mm. So, open Amen. your mind here yeah, to talk. And as I said, summarize your 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 book. Put it close. When you read, 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 you read your work. You just take the book, that summary, and you flow through it. Because it's not when they say, uh, okay, what led you to the world? Just summarize it for us. You will not start flipping through the through the book. When they say summarize your book, I will always advise you that talk without the book for most time. You can, a few seconds, you can maybe towards uh the end you can uh, make reference to you can look at some figures but most time talk just summarize it without looking at the book and let your words be accurate as possible that also help you to know that this work you did it and um, you own it and uh, you you internalize it and uh, you know what to do and each of the statistics that we are used at different points, try as much as possible to understand them in case you meet somebody who is dictated not to ask that. But most time, once you summarize it, you discuss your, your methodology, your objective, your methodology, then your result, the work is over. So book hardly fail anybody except the book is really bad or 
the examiner wants to do something different, which is not usual. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, That's so up. on Monday, yeah, good night. I wish you the very best of all. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm Thank waiting you very much, sir. Good night. Yeah. Sir. Okay, good night. Yeah. Time is far spent. Okay. And I wish you guys a uh, well hard, happy, is it a uh, well hard day tomorrow? Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. No problem. Wish you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure.